Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, everything seems to be on and working, which is good. We are beginning a new study today. We uh, finished up Ezra and Nehemiah last time we were together, and I think it's time for a little bit of variety. I know when I'm studying myself and when I'm listening to other uh, topics and other preachers talk about things, I like to, to keep things a little bit more fresh. It can be very easy to, uh, to stay comfortable and stay safe and stay in a book for a very long time, and um, that can be good for a very extensive study, but uh, sometimes it's good to kind of hop around and do different things for sake of uh, variety, keep things interesting, learn different things. And so we're going to maybe the theologically opposite of what we just did. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah are history books. They tell us about the returning exiles from captivity uh, for the Jewish people, rebuilding the, the city in Jerusalem, the walls, the temple, uh, restoring their, their covenant with God. And so fast forward a lot, and you're into the New Testament age. The prophecies of the Messiah coming, the Savior coming, uh, God in the flesh, God with us, has happened. Uh, Jesus the, the Christ ha was born. He lived, he preached, he teached, he healed, um, and then he died, and he was placed in a tomb, and three days later he overcame death. He then ascended to the right hand of the Father, as far as we're aware of text, of the text that talk about that, that issue. Um, and then the apostles, the 11, and then plus the 1 in Acts chapter 1, and then plus Paul a little bit later on, uh, they, not, they don't start the church, they are a part of the church. They are the ones that are allowed to open the keys, or with the keys of the kingdom, open the, the church doors, if you will, for all mankind, the Jews first, and the Samaritans, and then the uttermost parts of the earth, as it is said. Um, and so we look forward to where we are now in, in history, looking at the book of James, and the church has been around for probably at least 30 years. And so you have people that heard the gospel, they obeyed the gospel, they became New Testament Christians, the Lord added, to, uh, added them to the church when they were immersed in Christ, or they were baptized, um, and they are now living in a world where you have Jews, you have Gentiles that worship various gods, especially in the Roman world. Uh, and then you have this small sect of Judaism, as far as history is concerned for a, for a little while, of people that follow the Christ, people that are of the way, it's stated. And then later, uh, especially in the book of First and Second Peter, apparently the name Christian sticks. And so the book of James is probably the most practical book in the New Testament when it comes to how do you behave like a Christian. And that's a very interesting kind of way to think about it because there was no such thing as a Christian before the church. And so you could be a disciple of Jesus, but to be a Christian, to follow the Messiah, to be a, a little image bearer of the Messiah, if you will, is a radically new concept uh, in A.D. 30 or 40 when this book was written. And so it's a kind of a, an interesting way to think about it. One thing that can, be, uh, that can take away from the value of this kind of study is if you don't think about it from their perspective. Um, it's very easy and takes no prep work and no more reading than just opening a book and then reading it from your position in your shoes and seeing how it applies to you. There's a time and a place to do that. It's very practical, especially early on. Um, but later, you should want to develop a more mature mindset about, we have this document, and we consider it to be a part of the canon of God's book. So the Bible, scriptures, holy writings. Um, who wrote it? When did they write it? What was the cultural context? What was the intended recipient, let's say, and then understanding those kind of questions and having kind of that in the catalog of your memory uh, that, that, that adds some more depth to the text. I use the, the cooking illustration, right? Is it easy to go to the refrigerator and pull out a bag of a pre-made processed meal, dump it into a pan and microwave it? Is that food? Yeah, it's food, but 
there's another way to do it, right? There's a way that you can bring out so much more uh, nutrition and value and flavor. And, uh, and that's kind of an illustration to say when you think about your own personal Bible study and then what we do here collectively, um, I try not to ever give you a highly processed, super polished kind of thing that's nice but didn't really give you any satisfaction. That's why I love uh, going through the, uh, these books verse by verse. I know it can be a bit exhausting uh, if we always do that, I understand. Uh, even like when you have a nice meal, if you have a very nice meal over and over and over again, it can get boring. So um, that's what I want to do with you guys is uh, be able to do my best to, to show you the text and show you how it's, uh, how it's presented and give you all the information that I think is helpful in the moment for that conversation and then we'll move on. So that's kind of why in this image you have a little section of me where I am in the, in the picture, but the vast majority of what you're seeing is the Word of God. That's kind of the thought behind having it here in the corner is you can follow along with what verse we're in, what book we're in, but also the kind of main thing is, uh, is center stage. So uh, this is the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Old and New Testaments. It came out originally from a company called Crossway. It's probably a good name for them. Uh, 2001, there was a revision in 2007 to fix some typos and some small uh, errors in printing. Uh, and then there are other versions that come out after that, and they just fix typos and that kind of deal. So um, if you have an ESV, you might want to look and see what is the latest date that you have in the front of it, for example. Um, I've got one right here in paper format. And if you look right past that, the Holy Bible page, uh, it says ESV Text Edition 2011. So original copyright 2001, uh, you know, all those years later, 10 years later, they had some more revisions to make. Uh, they're not changing the translation, but they are fixing errors and typos and, and uh, misspellings. It happens. So that's how that works. Uh, any Bible that you have in print format or digital format for that matter, it's going to have the same process. Uh, I love when people talk about the, uh, the old King James Version. It's not really the King James Version. The King James Version was basically Middle English, and you probably couldn't read most of it. I know I couldn't. Um, but we've updated it as it goes on to fix typos and language and so on. And then the new King James translation, translation came out, and that's a whole different uh, beast. And then the more modern ones came out, NIV, ESV, uh, CSB, uh, NRSV, all these other you know acronyms that you love so much, they're around. So... Anyway, this is the ESV, uh, which I'm reading, and I wanted to state that with all that lengthy conversation to kind of give you an understanding of um, looking into different versions can be very helpful because different versions or translations, depending on which Bible you're talking about, um, they will, will render things different way according to their own preconceived biases, and that's for every translation. There's no perfect translation from one language to another, um, but when you look for one uh, that you really want to dive deep into, you want to make sure you know that it was translated not from a position of bias to emphasize certain things and to minimize other things, but it's, uh, you want a really good, strong textual translation. Uh, many versions are just Bibles that have been kind of compiled from other translations. Do they go back to the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic? Very important. They look at different versions of the Coptic and the Dead Sea Scrolls. How do they handle the, the, the distinctions that are made and the differences that are there, um, discrepancies between the two texts? So it's a whole big conversation. I've talked about it probably too much already, but just know what you're reading, right? Know if it's going to be just for you to get the gist of the text, like the Living Bible or or that kind of thing, you're just kind of getting a feel for what the book actually says, or are you really going to look word for word, accurate as possible translation from an ancient language to a very modern language in English? Um, modern because it's what we speak. Um, that's helpful to know. And the ESV is one of those where you can do a deep study 
and they are very deliberate about what words they choose because they're trying to get as close as they can to that nuanced um, uh, Greek. So, in the New Testament anyway. Uh, I trust it. I like it. It's not perfect. It's got problems. Um, but it's, uh, it's as accurate as I've seen thus far. So it's helpful to know that. It's also helpful to know that I learned this originally on King James. And then I transferred over to New King James when I wanted to get a bit more modern with the actual verbiage. And then I switched to ESV a couple years ago for uh, the textual variants that are there, and I like it. So uh, it's going to sound weird when I read this. It's not the words that I remember learning. So anyway, James um, was written by a guy named James. It's not surprising. Um, the interesting thing about it is there's three different verses, two in the book of Acts and one in, Gal in Galatians, um, and maybe a, a gospel account? I cannot remember, but there is a guy who is the half-brother of Jesus, and his name is James too. And he apparently was a Christian, so he was a follower of his other literal physical half-brother Jesus, who was the Messiah, he became a Christian, uh, obviously, and he had some work that he was doing in the church, especially in and around Jerusalem. That seems very interesting. Um, for the people that look at Christianity as some big, you know, ancient uh, hoax or, or whatever, um, it's interesting that we have a brother of a guy who claimed to be the son of God believe that his brother was the son of God. You know, if you're looking for people that criticize um, any kind of religious thought, your own family, they will know if you're the real deal or not. So that, for what it's worth, that's interesting. It's also interesting because this is probably the first New Testament writing that was done, which was a part of the scriptures, which was a part of God's book, if you will, the canon of the Bible. Um, they didn't have a Bible like we have, like just 66 books. We have Old and New Testament, and then some other books that are historical but not inspired, uh, which can be included in the canon for educational purposes, if you'd like. Um, but uh, the New Testament was written by people. You know, they weren't written by scribes, per se, of the Jewish uh, sect. They were just people that wrote, and some of them were known to be inspired because people kept copying them and copying them and copying them, and when they referred to them, there was always a distinction made that they were of a higher caliber than just an educational set of material. So James, we have a lot of copies of, and we have a lot of old copies of, fragments rather, um, and so that's how we know this is one of the earlier books, maybe the earliest, because the, uh, the volume of the fragments that we have and the dates of those fragments and references to the book of James and other writings of the first or the second and third century uh, reveal to us that it's a very ancient book. So that's helpful. Um, if this, this was the first book of the New Testament, I mean, the material is very good in the sense that it's very practical. Um, it is enlightening when it comes to uh, trials and temptations and remaining faithful and not going back into sin and uh, you know all those very practical things that you need if you are a early church member and you're going through a hard time. Um, this is a very good book to have. So that's why it was copied so much, no doubt. So let's begin reading here uh, in James chapter 1 and verse 1. I don't really have a plan of how long this is going to take. This book flows very fast. Uh, it goes from one subject to another to another to another, and it's over. Uh, so we'll go from James to 1 Peter and then 2 Peter. Um, but I want to get through James and kind of set that foundation for early Christian writing and then moving forward into 1 Peter. Okay, so James. A doulos is the Greek word here. Um, it can be rendered slave, it can be rendered bond servant, which is a slave for a little while, or it can mean servant. And Paul often uses that word doulos to talk about his own position at the beginning of a book. And so he sees himself, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if he's, this is the half-brother of Jesus, he recognizes him as the Lord. So he's God, right? Um, 
to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greeting. It's a weird way to talk about Christians, but there's a couple of parallel verses. Let's see, what are they? Um, yeah, Luke 22, 30, and then Acts 26, 7, which is very helpful to have in that little box there. Um, they talk about the 12 tribes, and they're not meaning the 12 tribes of Israel. They mean the, 12, the new 12 tribes, right? So um, you might think of the 12 tribes of Israel being just a very long way to say the people of God. This is basically what James and Peter will say later, is I'm talking now to the new people of God, the new 12 tribes um, in the dispersion, those that were dispersed from Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They were allowed to remain there for a while, and then they were dispersed from Jerusalem, the early church, back to where they came from. So they came from all over the Roman world, if they were Jewish or proselytes, they came for the Feast of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. They learned the gospel, became Christians, heard it, was there, and was edified by the early church leadership, the apostles and the Holy Spirit, and then they were dispersed back to where they came from. And so that's the best thing that could have happened because that they took the gospel with them, right? Um, and that's basically what you see Paul doing later is he becomes a Christian and he goes to these locations and he's finding groups of people that are either Jewish or Christians, and he's teaching them the Word of God. So it's the best way it could have happened, it's no doubt, uh, by God's design. So, a very fancy way to say, James, a slave of God and of Jesus Christ, to the new people of God, after you were dispersed from Jerusalem, greetings. Count it all joy. My brother, so again, to emphasize, again, he's writing to Christians because my brothers here is not a literal reference to his brothers, but the spiritual bond of brothers and sisters from the people of God. Um, here's a little note on the bottom about um, the my brothers part. It's interesting to read. Uh, the variant reading could be brothers or, and sisters, in the New Testament usage, depending on the context, so if it's talking just to a group of men, probably brothers, right? If talking about a group of people generally, it could be the whole family. The plural Greek word adelphoi, translated brothers, may refer either to brothers or to brothers and sisters. And so uh, there is, what is it? There is a translation that whenever it was in the context, brothers and sisters, or meaning brethren, right, the plurality of that in a fancy way, uh, they changed it to brothers and sisters. And there was a bunch of um, very conservative Christians that I knew that were enraged because the original Greek word was brothers, but, I mean, according to this, the context really dictates if we're talking to uh, men and women or just men. Um, if you're talking about the brothers in the church doing certain things as a role as a male versus you know the, the sisters having a female role that's obviously different uh, but generally he's saying here count all joy my brothers and sisters in christ when you meet trials of various kinds so in case you don't already know you can go through trials or difficulty of various kinds it's not just one thing Verse 3, well, why should we count it all joy? Why should we be ecstatic about meeting these trials? Um, for you know, or because you know, the testing of your faith, which is what these trials are, faith testers, they produce steadfastness, so patience, right? If you go through difficulty in life, you're being tested and if you make it through the other side, you've learned how to be more steadfast, to be more patient. Um, I always, when I think about the word patience, I always think about the DMV. I can't help it. Um, if you're in America, and you're probably in the South, and you live anywhere around where I've lived, <clears throat> there is a company, fast food chain, called Chick-fil-A. I think I talk about them more than anything else when it comes to fast food. Uh, the food is hot. It is delicious. Uh, it's not that bad for you in comparison to other things that you may choose. 
uh, is priced reasonably. But the most amazing thing recently has been um, the whole drive-through system. Like it used to be that you just pull up and you yell into a, a speaker box thing and they would read the order back to you and it's probably wrong. But now what you can do is you can pull up your phone and you can, they have your name and they have your information about uh, how you're going to pay. And then you order what you want by clicking the picture on your app and then you, you add it to your cart or to your bag, if you will. You prepay for it. You pull about the drive through you tell them your name, and they just hand you your food. Now, contrast that convenience, that use of technology, that uh, ingenuity to be able to get customers in and out, which no doubt has increased their revenues uh, dramatically, to going to get your license renewed at a physical DMV location. If you can't do it online, you have to make an appointment with the DMV. And then you have to drive to the DMV. And then you have to get in line. And then you get a little number. After you talk to someone about why you are there, you have to wait again as they go through all these different options of why you could be there and ensuring that you have the right documentation to actually do what you want to do then you have to wait and they call you up there and then you talk to a person and then it takes forever and then you pay for it and your whole day is gone if not two or three days it's not efficient it's not effective however there is a benefit to living through the process of going to the dmv at the very least you get the opportunity to become more patient if you allow yourself to grow in that process. You can be calm, you can be polite to people, um, you get to see various kinds of people doing various kinds of things. They could be losing their mind, they could be uh, bored until they're falling asleep, but whatever the case, it's an experience in and of itself. I'm not saying it's good, I don't enjoy it, but if you're looking for a positive side of having to go to the DMV, at least you leave and you could have an experience where you become more patient. The reason why I tell you that long illustration is these Christians in the first century, they were going through things for the first time. It was not efficient. It was not effective. It was not like everyone knew what they all believed. It wasn't like that their scriptures were already completed and you can just show them book, chapter, and verse and Matthew's account, what Jesus said. They're going on an oral tradition here uh, for the first couple, of, what, eight, 80 years until maybe it's all the way done, 96 years uh, after the first century begins before John is finished in Revelation. So it's been a generation or two before they actually have a document that they can show you that they have to explain how they got it and who the original author was. So what I'm saying is, they're going through a difficult time in the first century, and James just wants to remind them that if they look for the benefit of these various trials that they're, that they're enduring, they should be thankful for them because it produces patience and steadfastness. Now, we can use that little nugget of truth in our own daily life like going to the DMV, right? That's, that's a very minor thing compared to the great spiritual depth of the Lord testing your faith and allowing you to grow through that process, but that's, uh, it is what it is. Okay, verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, that's the Greek word for complete or mature or full grown and complete, Lacking in nothing. So if you want to be a full, mature Christian, let's say, you need to be able to have steadfastness or patience. And your perspective about difficulty arising in your life can motivate you to mature and to grow in your faith if you come at it from the right angle, right? Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom. So let's pause there. Wisdom is an interesting word. I guess the big thing that we often say, and I probably, I'm, I'm sure it's probably right, is you know, knowledge 
is information. And then wisdom is knowing when to use that information, right? Uh, you can have any kind of illustration here that, that floats your boat, but let's talk about a mechanic for a moment. A mechanic has a lot of information that they've learned over the years. They also have a lot of tools that they could use. Uh, but if you use the wrong tool in the wrong situation, you can't accomplish the correct job. So when it comes to wisdom, you can have a guy straight out of college who knows a lot about or straight out of education, rather, a lot about vehicles, but if they don't know how to do it properly, they're not going to be as effective. So the idea of wisdom, then, in contrast to that, is we can know a lot about life, a lot about different scenarios that may arise. We can know a lot of, about the Bible, for example. But if we don't have the wisdom to use the, tr the truth of God in a correct way, in the appropriate way, we can do a lot of damage, a lot of harm. Um, we can teach error, for example, and lead someone astray from the path of light. That's a negative thing. We don't want to do that. And so having the wisdom to not only navigate the Word of God, but navigate decision-making in life, especially under the consequences of trial and temptation, is a very important thing. Thus, the segue from trials in verse 2, 3, and 4 to wisdom in verse 5 if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So, a very practical thing here. If you're having a hard time knowing what's the right thing to do, you should talk to God about it. You should ask for his help. Ask for his guidance, and it, he will give it to you. There's no kind of wavering in that, and... Uh, Having said that, verse 6, but let him ask in faith or having faith that God will give to you generously with no doubting because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. This is not like the, the seashore scenario. It's like being on a boat out in the water and you see the wind moving the water around kind of back and forth. That's, an unwaver, that's a wavering person, rather, right? So you have someone who is, they don't know what the right thing to do is, and they're not really sure God's going to help them, but they're going to ask anyway. That's not the right scenario, James says. The right scenario is, I don't know what to do in this situation. I need, God, I need God's help, and if I ask him, I know he will come through with the wisdom that I need. Um, how will that happen? Well, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> Um, there are some among us who would say that can only happen, uh, God will give you that wisdom because you ask for it, and then you read your Bible. And that's definitely a tried and true method. I have come to decisions that are important to my life by looking at what the Word of God says, uh, looking at the book of Proverbs, for example, looking at the book of James, which is the, considered the New Testament book of Proverbs, and kind of seeing what's the right thing to do here. You can ask yourself, what would Jesus do in this situation? And then you try to make the best decision that you can. That definitely works. Um, but to say that it cannot happen in any other way besides you reading your Bible seems a bit bold to say. Now, I'm not saying that uh, a miracle will occur and God will inspire you in that moment in a literal way and you're going to make the right decision by the operation or the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I don't want to limit what God has not limited, if that makes any sense. Um, I used to be pretty staunch about it only happened through reading your Bible, but it doesn't seem like James is talking about that at all. So anyway, verse 7, because that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So if you're a person who wants to ask of God, but you don't really think God can help you, um, the Lord's not going to give you that satisfaction. He's not going to give you the information, the wisdom that you need to make the right call. Uh, verse 8, again, how would you define in a, in a more clear way, James, what a doubting man is? Well, he is a double-minded man. And the Greek there looks just like that, uh, if you want to translate it directly. 
He is a person who has two psyches. He has two personalities. He thinks that God can give him what, or he knows that God can give him what he needs, but he also does not know that God can give him what he needs. He's not consistent in his behavior. He is unstable in all his ways. So not just when it comes to asking God for wisdom, not when it comes to faith. He's just generally unstable. And I don't, we've all been there, right? I mean, faith does not come immediately to us when we're Christians. We learn the truth, we learn more about it, and then we begin to have some faith. But it takes experience, it takes time, it takes um, living life with God to kind of to cement that concept that God is there for you. Uh, I know in my own life there are moments where I can look back and say, um, absolutely, there was no chance that all of these things happened by coincidence that led to this great thing happening to me in, in my world. Uh, it's happened recently. Um, and so I, I look at that and I say, well, you know what? This is just God showing me. He's with me. He's in control. I need to relax. I need to, to trust him. He's got this. I need to have faith that he will, he will take care of whatever the condition is. So verse 9. We change gears here a little bit. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. So if you think about the demographics of who Jesus was appealing towards when he was on the earth, and really even the demographics of who is, who is um, uh, latching on to the word of God nowadays. Right? It's, it's been this way for a while. If you've got someone who's considered lowly or humble or um, poor in, the, in that sense, not in a financial way necessarily, but just poor in a sense of um, not proud, right? Um, they can receive the word easily. And they're being exalted because they're being lifted up from their place of lowliness and they're being exalted to know that they're a child of God. It's a wonderful thing. Now, the dichotomy, the contrast that is used here is verse 10. And let the, the rich uh, brother boast in his humiliation. So you might say, well, what's that all about? Well, there's this contrast, this paradox, right? If you want to be lifted up, you first must be lowly, right? We have the Son of God himself, God himself, and the version of the Son, Jesus. Um, if you've got a rich brother... Uh, someone who is rich in the sense of they have a high position of authority or power, or they're someone who is financially well-to-do, they get to use those benefits to help everyone. So, they, so he should be boasting in the fact that he doesn't have to trust in those riches. He's trusting in God, and he is humiliated in the sense of he's brought down to where he should be. Uh, because, verse 10, like a flower of the grass... He will pass away because the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass and the flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away from the midst of his pursuits. So, I mean, we're going through this right now in a literal sense that it's very hot here in Charleston and uh, it has been raining fairly well, uh, consistently. And, um, and very well. When you go out in the middle of the afternoon, you walk across your nice green grass, it's not that green. It's kind of yellow, and it's kind of crunchy. And then it rains again, and then you have your, your green grass again. It's kind of springy, right? That's the whole concept. But he's saying here that just like how the grass just withers away, that's going to be your end if you're trusting in those riches and your position of authority, if you will, um, to... to take care of you in the end. So, verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So, there's one of those beatitude moments, right? Um, 
And so blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. It goes back to the very beginning here. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. Like that's the whole point. And so the concept here is if you remain true, if you stick it out, if you get that patience, you get that endurance, become more mature, more full grown, then you'll be blessed in the end. Uh, because the crown of life is a metaphor, of course, for the idea of finishing the race. So if you, if you remain steadfast and you keep maturing, keep growing, you're going to make it to the finish line and be with God forever. So that's uh, verses 1 through 12. It's going to be, I think, about it for today. It's been about 45 minutes. So I uh, appreciate you guys being here. appreciate you. I'll see you next week, and we'll pick up in verse 13, and then we'll move on to First Peter from done with the book of James. Thank you so much.